Well, it's good to see you. If you're visiting with us, maybe for the first time or the first time in a while, my name's Stephen. I'm one of the pastors here. You know, Wednesday nights have been a great time of just extra connection with each other. If I haven't had a chance to personally meet you, I would love to put a face with a name. As a matter of fact, right outside this door uh, after this service, if we haven't had a chance to connect, I loiter right around an area called the Guest Suite. Maybe you saw it when you were coming in. I'd love to connect with you. Our staff, our pastors are there as well. And so we're jumping back into a series we started. Can you believe, I think we're on like week four or five of a series we started several weeks ago. We've been studying through the Ten Commandments really as the foundation of morality in our life and our culture. And tonight, I am super excited. We're going to be continuing that series. We're going to be talking about the Third Commandment today. And I'm super excited to introduce to you a great friend of mine, Pastor Eric Lawson. I can tell you all kinds of things about him. He has an incredible church that he planted in 2006 in St. Louis, Missouri. My wife and I actually got married in 2005 and moved with him to St. Louis to plant that church uh, in 2006. He was my youth pastor growing up. He led me to Jesus when I was 11 years old. Yeah, you, yeah. So a couple things that means. First of all, obviously he was a great pastor. He trained, put up with all kinds of mess from me. And obviously he is a lot older than he looks. Come on, somebody, anyways. (laughs) Now, I actually had a compliment paid to me uh, several years ago, actually by Andrea here, and she pulled me aside, and I don't know if you were even meaning uh, to, to, to pay me this compliment or not. She's very complimentary, so I'm sure she did. But she pulls me aside, and she says, you know what I love about you, Pastor Stephen? And I said, I don't know, but tell me, please. <laughs> and, and she said, you know, you're just, you're just so consistent. I, I love that you do what you say you're going to do, and when you don't, you make it right. And I love that, like, what you said you were going to start doing You've continually done. You're just so consistent. Can I, can I tell you where I learned that from? I actually learned that from this pastor right here. I watched him for years just be consistent through the ups, through the downs. And listen, he's a great pastor with a church of thousands all over St. Louis, an incredible leader, but he's even a better friend. And so Vintage Church, will you join me? Lean forward, join me in welcoming my good friend, Pastor Eric Lawson. Come on. Thank you. Wow. Thank you so much for that uh, amazing introduction. I hope I can live up to that. Uh, Pastor Stephen, uh, to me, has just truly been a dear friend. Uh, He was 11 years old uh, when he snuck into our youth group, and uh, he gave his life to Christ there. I do want to point out, I was nine years old when I led him to Christ. (laughs) Uh, What an honor to be here. Uh, Just so proud of Pastor Stephen. Stephen and Dr. Kyla, and the incredible work of God that uh, God has used them to build uh, in this area. Your pastor is incredibly gifted, incredibly talented. I learn a lot from your pastor. I learn so much about leadership. I learn about church, and I learn about organization. And uh, you know what I love being around him is he loves you. And every time I'm around him, there's a saying that back in the ancient times that all roads led to Rome. Uh, Here's what I've known about being around Pastor Stephen. All roads lead to Vintage Church. Every conversation, no matter where you start, you can be in geometry, physics, it all leads back to Vintage Church, and he's got a story he's got to tell about somebody that he's proud of, and it's you guys, and the core. And uh, so your pastors, they love you and are proud of you. And uh, so let's just give your pastor uh, such an appreciation for the great job they're doing. I know anytime there's a guest that comes into a church service, there's always a little bit of apprehension, like, is this going to be good? Uh, is it going to go on like forever? And uh, I was inspired by a story. There was a pastor who was known for long, boring sermons. And he had this elderly lady who felt it was her personal ministry to always criticize the pastor's sermons. And one day after church, she walked up to him and actually said something that seemed positive. She said, Pastor, I want you to know that today's message reminded me of the peace of God and the love of God. And he was like, oh, wow, thank you. What do you mean by that? She said, well, it reminded me of the peace of God because it passed all understanding. And it reminded me of the love of God because it endured forever. So hopefully that won't be our experience here today. I'm honored to be in this series, Civilized, and uh, let's do a quick recap. Uh, The first commandment, 
great, uh, good job, good job. Go back and watch it again. It was an excellent, excellent message. And the second commandment, and that too. So those, those are powerful. Obviously, they're life-changing. <laughs> just, you're, you're, just, you're just soaking in the presence of God here tonight. I get it. I understand. You're just feeling his presence. You're breathless. It happens in God's presence. Yes, he's here. Uh, no other gods and no graven images. Today, we're going to be looking at the third commandment. And I'm going to be honest, okay? Uh, as a guest speaker, what you always do, the rule of thumb is you never come in with a new sermon. You never do. You, you, you only come into a church where you've preached the sermon like 50 times, you know every joke works, and you've got it memorized. But when Pastor Stephen gave me the opportunity to either go ahead and teach the third commandment or to come in with a, a new message, I, I really wanted to go with a message I knew was tried and true. But as I watched Pastor Stephen's this series, I was like, oh, this is so good and the content's so powerful. I didn't want to break the flow of this message. In fact, I'm going to steal this message when he's done writing it, and I'm gonna preach it at our church. I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna repackage the artwork so he won't know. I'll title it a little different. And that's okay. Some of you are like, isn't that plagiarism? No, pastors, we call it creativity. Creativity is forgetting who you stole it from. So that's okay, and we're friends, so it's all good, all right? And so I was like, you know, I, I have to preach the third commandment because this series is so good, I don't want to break the flow that God's been uh, just imparting to the church through this. So I actually wrote a sermon that I've never preached before. So if it's not any good, just cut me some slack and go, he tried, okay? Like he at least brought a fresh word, okay? So can we at least, you know, at the end of just as you walk out and go, hey, good try, good try. Good effort. <laughs> All right. Um, it's interesting where God gave Israel the Ten Commandments. He didn't give the Ten Commandments in the land of Egypt during the night of Passover as they were getting ready to be delivered from Egypt. We know that Egypt is always a picture of the world. Pharaoh is always a picture and type of Satan. God didn't give the Ten Commandments to the nation of Israel when they got into the promised land, the land flowing with milk and honey, which is a picture of the fullness of a spirit-filled life that God has available for all of us. He gave it to them in a place called the wilderness, a place in between. And there's several important implications as to why God gave it in the middle of this wilderness. First of all, because it wasn't attached to any land, it means it's for all people everywhere. The Ten Commandments apply to everyone. Secondly, it's applicable wherever you are. Had God given them the Ten Commandments in the promised land, their, their nation and their, 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 their country, they would be tempted to think that I don't have to keep it because I'm not in my homeland, which is always the temptation for us as Christians. Well, I'm not at church. I got the other six days. No, God is saying this is applicable whether you're at home and it applies while you're driving. Just going to be honest and transparent. I'm a work in project. A pro progress. I have broken the Ten Commandments many times while I've driven, uh, mostly murder. I have committed many murders inside of my heart while driving. I'm a work in progress. I'm just an honest pastor, not a perfect pastor. And the third thing is this. It's for everyone, not just a privileged group of people. Had God given it to them inside the land of Israel, Israel was always divided up into territories, so it would have fallen into somebody's tribe, then they would have felt special and they would have been the elites of Israel. God gave it in the middle of nowhere because this is not for just high status or low status. This is for everyone, all places, all times, all throughout human history. Now it's 10 commandments and that's not an accident. Could have been 11 commandments, could have been 12, but it was 10. Because numbers inside of scripture have significance. The number 12 is the number of divine government. There's 12 tribes governing Israel. There's 12 uh, disciples, 12 apostles. 12 is the number of government. 10 is always the number of testing inside of scripture. The 10 commandments are a test as to our loyalty and our devotion for God. When you look at 10 throughout scriptures, you'll see there were 10 virgins. There were five foolish, there were five wise. The tithe is not 9%, it's not 11%, it's 
10%. Why is it 10%? Because the tithe is a test. What is it testing? It's testing the first commandment as to whether or not you will have no other gods before me. The easiest way to see whether or not you're keeping the first commandment is look at your checkbook. If God is not in your checkbook, God is not truly your God. God is not truly your source. He's not number one in your life. Because what you love the most, you spend money on it. Yes. Right, men who are married? <laughs> Ladies, what would you think of your man if he says, baby, I love you. You're the sugar in my Kool-Aid and the peanut in my Snickers bar. Mm. But I ain't spending any money on you. But I just want you to know I love you. Is that going to fly? No. You spell love, M-O-N-E-Y and T-I-M-E. All right. How are we doing? So the Ten Commandments was really just a test. The law was given, especially the moral law of the Ten Commandments, which Pastor Stephen did a fabulous job teaching on the difference between the ceremonial law, which Jesus fulfilled, and the moral law, which is always for all of us. It was really a test to, number one, show us that we have failed miserably, uh, just like speed limits are a test. Uh, there was a, a man who was an elderly man, and he was speeding, and he got pulled over by a police officer, and the police officer said, sir, um, do you know you were going uh, 75 in a 55? And he goes, oh, officer, I didn't know that. Well, his wife was sitting next to him in the seat, and she goes, oh, Harry, you were going at least 80, and you know it. He kind of looks over at his wife like, baby. Then the officer says, and also, I'm going to write you up because your taillight's broken. Oh, officer, it's broken. I had no idea it's broken. Oh, Harry, you know that's been broken for months now. <laughs> Stop it. And he goes, and sir, I'm also going to give you a citation because I notice you're not wearing your seatbelt. Well, officer, I took it off when I saw you coming up. Oh, Harry, that's not true. You never wear your seatbelt. Shut up, please, he said. The officer kind of leans in through the window and says, ma'am, does he always talk to you this way? And she said, only when he's drunk. <laughs> the law, that is funny. The law <laughs> was given to point out our need for a savior. And it is the moral compass in which we should live by. Exodus chapter 20, verse 7. We're going to take a look at the third commandment. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. God takes very serious how we handle his name. Now, the word take means in Hebrew, it's tissa, which means to carry. When we hear the third commandment, we think of a shallower uh, aspect of it, that, you know, taking the Lord's name in vain is, you know, OMG in a text, or using Jesus' name, or, you know, using God in a sentence when you hit your thumb with the hammer, or stub your toe in the middle of your night and step on a Lego. And yes, that's inappropriate, and yes, we should honor God's name, but it's much deeper than speaking the name of God, because in the Hebrew, it literally means to carry the name of God. As Christians, we carry the name of Christ. It literally means little Christ. We're carrying his name. And what God takes seriously is what we do in his name because we represent God. To a, a jihadist terrorist who is getting ready to murder somebody, they shout, God is great, and then kill and murder innocent people. This is what God is talking about, that you don't use the name of God and blame him for horrible things you do. Years ago, even inside of Christianity, inside of Crusades, many horrible atrocities throughout history have been done in the name of Jesus, and God has nothing to do with it. We as Christians are carrying his name. It's not just that when we do evil or bad, it reflects bad on us. What God is serious about is it reflects bad on him. Point number one, when we take the Lord's name in vain, it reflects badly on him. I'm convinced as a Christ follower now for going on 37 years, over 30 years in full-time ministry, my observation is this, in thousands of conversations, most people that say they're rejecting Christ or rejecting God really aren't rejecting Jesus. 
Most of them, what they're really doing is rejecting our poor presentation of Jesus. In fact, I, I often, you know, ask somebody, and when they go, well, I don't believe in God, I go, well, tell me, describe to me the God you don't believe in. And they always have a description. Well, I don't believe in this kind of, and I go, I don't believe in that kind of God either. Because whatever they describe never matches my Jesus. I go, I don't believe in that kind of Jesus either. And usually they attach it to about four different types of Christians that they met. Look, you can reject Christians. I'm not a Christian because of Christians. I'm a Christian in spite of Christians. I'm a Christian because of Jesus. You can't blame walking away on God because you encountered some mean Christians. The church is a hospital full of sick people. You're going to encounter some sick people because the hospital exists for sick people. Look, we're all sick somewhere. We're all a work in progress. But Jesus is perfect. But what God holds serious is that we as Christians take his name as we carry it with a badge of honor and with the sense of awe and with the sense of reverence, understanding, as Paul said, you are our epistles known and read of all men. I like what one great preacher said to a young group of missionaries. He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel and use words if necessary. I love to challenge our church from time to time with this statement. I'll say, if you were charged with the crime of being a Christian and they were to bring evidence against you and you couldn't defend yourself with words, would there be enough evidence from your life to convict you that you actually are a Christian without words? Because our life is an open book. Our life is where people see Jesus Christ. What Jesus do they see in us? The Lord's Prayer, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Hallowed is, is, is it's holy, it's holy ground. Do we carry the name Christian in such a way that it brings honor and a sense of hallowedness to the name of Jesus? Or do we live in such a way that it makes God's name hollow? And there's a big difference between hallowed and hollow. If, I know this is so many of you are military and military family, and I'll tell you one place that is hollowed is Arlington Cemetery. It's a very sobering place. When you go there, you feel it just, you're stepping on holy ground. You're there of those who laid down their life for the freedom that we celebrate in this country each and every day, those that paid the ultimate price. It's a very hallowed and honoring, reverencing place. We also serve someone who laid down his life for our freedom that we enjoy, enjoy each and every day, and that is Jesus. We should carry a sense of honor in how we carry his name each and every day. When I Gave my life to Christ. I was between my uh, freshman and sophomore year. And in my junior high years, I grew up in California and I was, I was a party animal. And um, I, uh, I wasn't smart enough to be like with the nerds. I wanted to be with the nerds, but, but I wasn't smart enough. And uh, I wanted, so then I, I wanted to be, at, you know, with the jocks, but I wasn't, obviously I wasn't athletic enough. And uh, so the, the stoners would accept anybody. Like, you know, just say, <laughs> come on in here. You know, you bring, you bring the bag, you're in, all right? So, so all through junior high, I was a stoner, rocker. I, I had the sweetest hair. I had this Eddie Van Halen hair, perm, 80s parachute pants. It, it was beautiful. Like, I had ladies coming up to me like, oh, your hair is so beautiful. And uh, that, that was the 80s, all right? So that was like 82, 83, 84. That's, I'm dating myself, all right? So that was junior high. Well, I, I, I was never ashamed of my sin as a sinner. Like, I was proud of my sin. I was like, I'd come in from school on Monday morning. Man, I partied like I threw up six times. It was awful. Well, I got saved, and, and I, I was just as radical for Jesus as I was for the devil. I said, Jesus, I said, Jesus, I was never ashamed of serving Satan, and I will never be ashamed of you. I never apologized for my sin, and I'm never going to apologize for being a Christian. And my life just was instantaneously turned right side up. And it was incredibly obvious to every student in my school body that, wow, 
And so I got nicknamed evangelist like day one. Now, I wasn't like running around preaching to everybody, but they go, what happened to you? And I would just tell them, Jesus changed my life. I remember I was walking through the high school locker room one time and there was a group of the, the druggies hanging up on, the, on the, the, the lockers there and they're like, hey, dude, you're that evangelist kid. Come on over here. Preach to us. Tell us about Jesus. It's funny because my whole school wanted to know about Jesus. So I'm like, all right, man. And I'm just saved. All I knew was John 3, 16, and I forgot that half the time, all right? So I just walked up to him, and I'm just like, you know, uh, for God so loved somebody that he did something, and from the looks of things, you need that something. Like, and I, that's, that's all I knew. I, I, I said, Jesus changed my life. He could change your life too. So I saw a kid playing with a, with a lighter, right? And so this is where I could see my early calling to youth ministry ultimately to being a visual communicator. I said, hey man, let me borrow that for a minute. So I grabbed the lighter, grabbed the dude's hand. I put the lighter under his hand, set his hand on fire. And he's like, woo! I said, that's what hell's like. You wanna go? No, let's pray. So we had revival in the locker room with a lighter. <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyway, that's how I lived in high school, all right? So my senior year, my senior year, it was fun. I made a commitment in my heart as a high schooler. I said, Lord, when I graduate this high school, I want to be able to look every student in the eye and know at least once I shared Christ with them. And, and I got there at the end of my high school. I was able to know. I shared Christ with everybody that I had the opportunity to get to know at one time or another in that three years. I got to share Christ. And um, my, I'm coming to the end of my senior year, and this kid comes up to me. He goes, hey, Eric, you don't know me. I go, yeah, you're right, I don't. And he goes, I'm so-and-so. And he goes, I knew you back in junior high. I, I, I saw you. And he goes, I was one of the kids that voted you least likely to succeed. Because I actually had achieved that uh, award in junior high, least likely to succeed. And, um, and he said, I watched you come into sophomore year talking about this Jesus thing, talking about how he changed his life. And, and I said to myself, it won't last. He, I said to myself, it won't work. And he said, I watched you day in and day out not change and just continue to walk with Jesus. And I got invited to a youth group a couple weeks ago and I gave my life to Christ because I watched you. I share that to say, there are people around you in your job, in your community, out there, soccer mom, soccer mom, <laughs> soccer mom. <laughs> There are people out there watching how we live. And they may not be saying, hey, could you come up to me and share your eschatolog eschatological views of the end times? They're not coming up to you asking deep, esoteric, theological things, but they're watching you to see if the Jesus you serve is real. And do you know when they're watching you the most is when your life falls apart. See, there are people who see Jesus through the goodness, but there are people who see Jesus in our midnight hour, like Paul and Silas, Silas, when we've been beaten and we feel no way out, and yet we're still praising God. People are watching, is Jesus real? We have no idea the impact until we stand before God of how we carry his name each and every day in our world. Exodus chapter 20 and verse 1 gives us motivation as to why we want to keep the Lord's name honored and hollow. As he's introducing the commandments, and God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. The word your in Hebrew in this context is singular. Yes, God's speaking to the nation as a people group, but each of these commandments are to you individually, and he's attaching it to remember what I did, and that is I delivered you. I redeemed you. You were slaves 400 years. You had no hope, and I am a personal relational God that heard the cries from your bondage and came down to deliver you. When we take God's name in vain, it diminishes our relationship with him. It diminishes the relational quality that we have with God. God is reminding us to honor and value his name because he's a relational God. He redeemed us. He paid a price for us. 
Therefore, we need to honor and value that name. In fact, the Jewish scribes, when they were writing the name of God, they had such a reverence for the name of God. We actually don't know the Hebrew pronunciation of God. We, we'll say Jehovah or we'll say Yahweh, but we don't actually know how it was pronounced because they didn't write the vowels because they had such a reverence for the name of God. In fact, the scribes would wipe the pen or throw away the pen after every time they just wrote the continents for the name of God, and then they would have to wash their whole body in water. So think about that. How many thousands of times is God mentioned inside of the Holy Scriptures and they would have to stop, wipe their pen, and take a shower? That's how much reverence they had for the name of God, yet we have a culture that walks around with Jesus is my homeboy t-shirts. Jesus ain't your homeboy. He's king of kings, lord of lords, and he's coming back. And last time I read, his robe is dipped in blood, not bath and body works. Because he's a conquering king. He's a warrior. Our words diminish relationships, or they can elevate relationships. The way you speak to your spouse will elevate or diminish your relationships. And the way we speak about God elevates or diminish our view of him. Because the way I talk about you changes my view of you. This is why gossip is considered one of the most deadly sins. In the Proverbs, it talks about, you know, there's six things God hates. Seventh is an abomination. Like, one of the six things is murder. I go, yeah, that's pretty bad. But the seventh thing that God calls an abomination is one who sows discord among his brethren. We call that prayer requests in church, by the way. We don't gossip, we have prayer requests. (laughs) Here's how I stop that. Somebody who wants to come up to me and talk about a fellow believer, uh, instantly I go, wow, you know what? I don't even need to know the details, but I can see you have a a burden for this this sister in Christ or this brother in Christ. We're just gonna go ahead and take a few moments. You you, you pray, we're gonna pray right now. You pray for them. I'll grab their hand so they can't walk. (laughs) I love this, it's so good. Grab their hand and you're holding them. And, and say, all right, you pray. <laughs> it's so good. You do that once, word will get out to the rest of the prayer chain, and, and you, won't, you won't ever be a, a victim of gossip ever again. <laughs> gossip, according to the Jewish rabbis, was the equivalent of murder. It was worse than murder. Because you're murdering somebody's reputation. See, if I come up to you and go, hey, did you know about so-and-so? then here's what just happened. It diminished your view of them, and here's what happens. You can't receive from them now. Because maybe God wanted to use that member of the body of Christ to help you in your walk somewhere, but that reputation just got murdered, and it hindered what God can do in that relationship. When we don't value the name of God and we cheapen the name of Jesus, it diminishes the God we serve and what he can do inside of our life. This happens in marriage. Uh, There was a man who was arguing with his wife and during a fight he said, how can you be so beautiful and so stupid at the same time? That's gonna hurt a marriage. But she had a great answer. It's simple. I'm beautiful, so you'd be attracted to me. I'm stupid, so I'd be attracted to you. Now, (laughs) that's funny, but not good for marriage. (laughs) How we talk to one another is going to impact relationship. Whether we realize it or not, how we talk about God and how we reflect God hinders our ability or helps our ability to receive from God. John 14, verse 23, Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. What are the motivations to keep God's commandments? What are the motivations to keep the Ten Commandments? The greatest motivation is a love for God. Now, there are other motivators that cause us to live moral lives. There are other motivators that cause people to want to live by the Ten Commandments. The lowest motivator is avoidance of pain. But this is not necessarily bad. It's often where we start. It's why we discipline our children. When our, right? Target mom? <clears throat> Little, little Damien Jr. that seems to scream, mine, mine, I want it. Yeah, right. Let me just say what everyone wanted to say but didn't. Please take your child outside and discipline them. Now, 
how you go about that, you know, be legal and, and you know, and, and, and things like that, uh, but just discipline. So when I would sit my kids down, I, I would discipline them and I, I would have a conversation with them. I'd say, uh, this is going to hurt you more than it hurts me. Don't lie. Don't say, this is going to hurt me more than you. No, it's not. <laughs> so this is going to hurt you more than it hurts me. <laughs> and I'm going <laughs> to say, now, the purpose of this Whatever consequence it was, and consequences changed as, as my kids got older. So uh, the consequences changed. So I would just simply say, um, it's, this is what we're teaching you. The Bible's teaching us. You make bad decisions, life hurts. Regardless of what certain curriculums teach you in public education, bad choices hurt. And it's not a respecter of persons. You make bad choices, life's going to hurt. That is a motivator to avoid pain, but it's the lowest form of motivator. Let's be honest. There's some of us, we haven't killed certain people because we don't want to go to prison. Just be honest. I, I'm too attractive for prison. I, I, don't, I don't want prison ministry. I'm just not gifted for that, okay? So there's just some people I haven't killed because of that. That's the lowest form of Christianity right there, and I'm going to be honest. That has kept me in check some, more than once. Number two, self-benefits. There are times we keep the Ten Commandments because we know it benefits us. Fifth commandment, honor your father and mother, that it might go well with you. There are benefits when we keep commandments. So there, that is, but that's still a lower form because it's me-centered. Yeah. I'm going to do good for my wife because it benefits me later. <laughs> Next month or so, it's going to benefit me. <laughs> Number three. Because I love you, I'm going to make good decisions. You know, there's just times you go, baby, I love you. I want to buy that outfit. Baby, I love you. You know, I'm, I'm going to do this. And that's good. But the highest form of motivation to keep the commandments and to do good is what Jesus said, love him. Yes. We obey the word of God because we love him. And we love him because he first loved us. Yes. See, there are times it makes no sense to obey the word of God because it costs me. It hurts me. I'm suffering to say no to my flesh and what my flesh wants to do. But when I love Jesus, I go, Jesus, regardless of what it costs me, I'm going to obey what you said because I love you and I love you because you first loved me. The way to grow in your walk with Christ is just to keep falling in love with Jesus. The way you turn your back on sin is just to turn your face to him. The goal of Christianity is don't sin, don't sin, don't sin. It's love Jesus. Because when I love Jesus, I want to be with Jesus. And wherever I'm with Jesus, sin gets farther in the distance. Number three. Exodus 20, verse 1. And God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Number three. When we take the Lord's name in vain, it mocks his redemption. It mocks and lowers and diminishes the price Jesus paid to redeem us from the agora, from the slave market of sin. Acts chapter 4 and verse 12. There is salvation, nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Hell loves to hear the name of Jesus mocked. Why? Because it's the name above every name. It's the name by which no other person can be saved other than through the name of Jesus. It's interesting, uh, when you look around our culture and somebody cusses, when was the last time you heard somebody, you know, on, on a job site hit, hit, hit their, you know, thumb with a hammer and go, dang Buddha, <laughs> dang Muhammad? Yeah, you'll get the ACLU after you. But you, you can Jesus H all you want and nobody raises an eyebrow. How is it that the name of Jesus has become a cuss word because hell hates and fears the name that defeated and triumphed over hell and Satan's cohorts? You just watch a talk show today about tolerance that has a panel of religious people up there representing different religions, and you want to hear tolerance and how we tolerate one another, and you can talk about Islam, and you can talk about Krishna, and you can talk about anything you want, but the moment Jesus gets mentioned, everything but tolerance happens. It's funny to me, those that preach tolerance are the least tolerant when it comes to our rights 
to worship and praise the name of Jesus. Why is that? There's a demonic spirit that wants to mock the name of the one who conquered him. And when we take the Lord's name in vain, whether it's a vain lifestyle or it's a life that doesn't match our lips, hell celebrates because we're doing the work of hell to diminish the name of the King of Kings. Colossians tells us that Jesus triumphed over hell. That word triumph in the Greek is a picture of what a Roman general would do when he conquered more than 5,000 of the enemy. They would have a triumphal procession and they would bring their soldiers that were captives and they would bring the general that they conquered and they would strip them of all their clothing and they'd put them in shackles and that, that soldier would ride in on a, the, the conquering general would ride in on a stallion and they would parade up and down all the cities of Rome's the people that they conquered. Little children would come out and mock them and throw food at them. That's what Jesus did when he defeated Satan and his cohorts. The Greek word there is triumph. Jesus paraded hell up and down. And Satan didn't like it. And so he loves nothing more than for us as Christians to minimize and diminish the name by which we're saved. There's power in his name. Uh, my, my little brother, uh, it's funny how you can beat up your brother when you're small, but nobody else can beat up your siblings, right? Like, you know, you, you can be cruel to your brother and sister, but nobody else can. So um, I'm, I'm about eight years older than my brother, and he had, uh, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't saved yet. I was 15. I was going to be saved in a few weeks. And... Uh, <laughs> So he, he was seven or so, and there was this kid that was kind of like between our age that pushed my little brother down on his bicycle and, you know, kind of just bullied him and, and beat him up. So my little brother came home and told me, and he was crying. So I jumped into the back of my friend's pickup truck. All my friends were older than me. They all drove. And I had done martial arts during that time, and I was pretty good. I, I had a really beautiful jump-spinning roundhouse kick. I could kick the top of a doorpost just standing still. And I actually was decent. You know, I, you know obviously, life's been good to me. But back then, I, I, was, I was something else. And uh, so I uh, jump. I, I get into my friend's pickup truck, and we go, no, we go to this park where this kid is playing with all of his buddies. And my friend Bronco, <laughs> Bronco, what a name. Uh, his real name was Carol, so Bronco was cooler. So uh, he, he pulls up. I jump out of the pickup truck, man, and I just go flying. It's like one of those Chinese movies, and I'm just wah, flying sidekick, and I just go flying out of that car like 37 feet, and, uh, and I land right in front of the kid, and I go, hey, man, I heard you hurt my little brother. And the little kid, like, he just freaked out, turned white. And I go, don't you ever mess with my brother again. And I did this spinning roundhouse kick. And it was like slow motion. I'd do it for you, but I'd rip something. And it just, <laughs> and, and it was so good. It literally just like touched the tip of his nose. I didn't want to hurt the kid, but just touched the tip of his nose. He freaked out. And I said, if you ever, ever mess with my brother again, I will find you. My little brother, all he ever had to do, he would literally <laughs> ride his bike up to the kid and go, hey, Eric. <laughs> He'd do that. He'd just mock him. Eric. All he had to do was say my name. Why? Because I defeated his bully. We have power in the name of Jesus. Hell trembles when we say the name of Jesus. I'm closing. Number four, when we take the Lord's name in vain, it reduces our faith. It reduces our faith. Why? Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. See, we magnify and we minimize with the words that we say. When I talk about my God, it magnifies my God and it minimizes my problem. But when I'm magnifying my problem, I'm minimizing my God. Now, you can't make God smaller or bigger, but you can make him smaller or bigger to you. Jesus went into his hometown and couldn't do any miracles there because of their unbelief. You and I determine how powerful God can be inside of our life. So when we hear ourselves diminishing God, we're diminishing our faith, which is diminishing God's ability to move and act in our life. 
Out of the three million or so Israelites, only two made it into the promised land. Why? Because of unbelief. Because they minimized God with their words. We were like grasshoppers in our own eyes. They're minimizing God. Taking the name of God in vain by making God hollow and God empty. He's everything but hollow and he's everything but empty. Remember, what's in your mouth is what will always be in your mind. And that's why in Joshua chapter 1, he said, this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you will meditate therein day and night. Because whatever you talk about the longest will always be the strongest inside of your life. I once read this, the sun produces more power in one second than all the human race has consumed and used throughout human history. Our sun produces more power in one second than all human history is used. And our God created that with the word. Jesus, the creator, spoke that into existence and 200 billion, billion other stars and he said, praise myself, I'm good, and he sat down. (laughs) That power resides and rests in us. That power, the power of Jesus has been given to us in his name. The great news about Jesus is it's not about trying harder, it's about just simply trusting more. We don't achieve the Ten Commandments really by trying harder, it's really by trusting more in the finished work of what Jesus did, because at the end of the day, it's about Jesus in us, Jesus through us. Yes, we should keep these, but the greatest way to keep these is to rest in who Jesus is and his power in and through our life. I'll close with the story. Uh, I, I, was, uh, I flew here on an airplane. Deep thoughts with Eric. And uh, so now as we're taking off, what would you have thought if the, the flight attendants are getting ready to fly and then and all of a sudden I start doing this? And that flight attendant comes up to me and says, uh, sir, Mr. Lawson, can I help you? Nope, got it under control. What are you doing? I'm helping you out. What do you mean you're helping us out? Well, if it's to be, it's up to me. And this is a big plane. And so we better get this baby off the ground. <laughs> Woo! <sighs> now, after a while, I'm going to get tired. We might be at 30,000 feet, and there I am, and my arms are getting tired, and I'm like, whoa, I don't think I can keep this thing up forever. All right, everybody, hope you know Jesus, because we're going down. And all of a sudden, I stop flapping, and I realize, hey, we didn't go down. Why is that? (laughs) Because it was never me. (laughs) In Christianity, here's what we do. Woo! If it's to be, it's up to me. Whoa, thank you, Jesus. Aren't you glad I'm helping you? (laughs) It's Jesus in us. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Christianity is really about trusting that when Jesus hung on the cross and said it is finished, he actually meant that. The Satan's already defeated. We fight from victory, not for victory. When America shows up to a war, we're just letting them know it's already over. It's over the moment we said we're coming because we're the greatest military in the world. That's just my personal opinion. <laughs> so we fight from victory, not for victory. In Christianity, we're fighting from victory. Jesus did for us what we can never do for ourselves. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus, the greater one who lives in us, the greater one who redeemed us. We were slaves to sin, and you came and bought us with your blood to redeem us, to set us free so that we can fulfill your plan and your purpose for our life so that Christ in us can let a lost world know how good you are. Lord, as we, and myself included, as we listen to your scriptures and your word, we all see areas, gaps inside of our life that we need to close, areas in our life that we need to adjust, areas that aren't reflecting Christ well, and we thank you that there's no condemnation in Christ. We thank you that you aren't beating us, you aren't guilting us, you aren't condemning us. We're forgiven in Christ Jesus, and so Lord, we just ask you to forgive us. And Lord, we just want to go ahead and make those adjustments. We make those tweaks. Holy Spirit, empower us, equip us, show us steps that we need to take so that we can look more like Christ each and every day. 
and this earth. We thank you that the work you began, according to Philippians 1, 6, you're faithful to complete. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said? Amen. 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 Give it up for Pastor Eric. I'm going to actually invite you to stay with us. We're going to open up the floor. Right here is great. We're going to open up the floor to some Q&A. Uh, you know, we've kind of kept this format this entire time. Um, I think it's been really, really helpful. I want to encourage if you have any questions, uh, shoot them to that number. You can also shoot up your hand in just a minute. We'll have some people with microphones roaming around. I want to just make sure that we kind of understand a little bit of the boundaries with some Q&A. First of all, we reserve the right to not answer any mean questions, okay, or rhetorical statements. Uh, we also want to make sure that we understand the question, and so we may rephrase it, or we may toss it out completely. If we do that to one of your questions, think about it while you're sitting there, and then maybe make it a little more simple for us. Is that okay? All right, and so we're going to go ahead and do that. We have up here, uh, Lindsay is going to be helping us uh, kind of curate our questions, and then we have Pastor Travis, Pastor Eric, and myself, and so we'll get started. Lindsay, what do you got? Yeah. Just to remind you guys, if you're not comfortable with raising your hand and, and asking it out loud, it's not too late to text it in, so the number's still right there. You can see Go ahead and text those in. Um, okay, so first question, why do you think we've reduced not taking, in quotations, not taking the Lord's name in vain down to a simple phrase we shouldn't say over the years? Okay. Well, I think a lot of it's just not understanding. I think a lot of times, like, um, you know, I, I believe it was uh, sometime in the mid-'80s, you know, we have this big thing happening in the school districts where you start removing the Ten Commandments from the wall, uh, kind of from the perfect view. Uh, we talked about this week one, how when our, the founders of this country, um, I believe it's the greatest country on earth as well, but it was founded on uh, the Judeo-Christian ethic, which is the Ten Commandments. And I think what's happened is as our culture has moved further and further away from really understanding what they are, it's just easier not to understand than it is to lean in and understand. So I think one of the reasons maybe it was, it's been reduced is likely... They don't really understand it. You know, they don't really understand the depth of it. I was thinking about this a little bit as you were talking, Pastor Eric, just about how, you know, we, we've talked about how the first five commandments really deal with our relationship with God, how that's really the foundation. They form a cross. That's the vertical. And then you have the, the back five, which is how we deal with other people. It's also found in the greatest commandment. You'll sum up the law. Jesus says, I got your Pharisees. It's love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. That's the second one that precludes from it. And I started thinking about how these are kind of arrayed with kind of God first, like no other gods before me. That's really big. But big gods start off as little gods in the form of idols, have no graven image. And idols form when we don't revere God's name like we should. The whole hollowed and hollow, man, what's a, what a great uh, a reference there. So that, that's, that's, I think it's likely just ignorance. We just don't really know. What, any other? I think part of it too is, and Pastor Eric, talked about this a while ago you know that word vain don't take the name of the lord's name in vain it means worthless and so it, it if we don't value him to begin with then we're going to lessen him when we speak about him but the things that we value even though they're not of value things we do that we think boy this is important in god's <laughs> side that may not be important we've we've elevated that up and so we we cheapen him for the expense of that and really the paradigm should be the other way um, and so it, there's a lot of subjectivity in that, I think. I agree with both. Uh, a lot of times it's not just one, it's, it's a collection of things. Uh, I think another reason is uh, it, human nature tends to gravitate to religion over relationship when it comes to God. And so I think somewhere along the line, uh, religion always looks for a checklist because I got to measure myself and how I'm doing, so I have to quantify it. So we go, well, it's this, and it's this, and it's this. So somewhere, religion quantified, don't do this, don't say that, don't do this, and you know, don't, your hair needs to be like this, and your can't, you know, pants this, and all that. That's religion, because when you move from relationship, that's all you have, is religion. And so I think that was a, a big shift that minimized it, yeah. Yeah, I, you know, as you were saying that, I was thinking about how Jesus had the, the most direct um, things to say to the religious people who had done just that. They had made it about a bunch of rules. Yeah. And I think about when he looks at them and says, you know, you guys say don't murder, but any one of you that's had murderous thoughts in your heart, well, you violated the spirit of it. Yeah. It was about relationships, about the big idea of following God. That's, that's, I never thought about it like that. It's good. It's good. Any live questions? Go ahead and shoot your hand up if you've got one. No? Okay. 
Are tattoos of the Lord's name a violation of the third commandment, or are they an appropriate reminder of the power of God? So like when someone gets Yahweh or tattoos of Jesus. That's you. <laughs> sure, church, man. I, uh... I'll clean up whatever you miss. Okay. Whatever you miss. <laughs> My opinion. My opinion. Um, I, I personally, okay, uh, those are loaded questions. <laughs> So here, here's why. Somebody will take what a pastor says. You can always find somebody who will validate what you want. You just ignore the other 10 that disagreed until you find the one and then you leverage their name. Okay, so that, that's what, so I tend to stay away from specific. So what do you think specifically go, about that question? So here, here's my two cents. I go, can you do this with a clear conscience feeling you are reflecting Jesus well and it not tarnish your, your, your witness? Yeah. And are you okay with the long-term ramifications of this? Yeah. Yeah. And, I, and is this going to hinder or is this going to broaden or, or hinder your influence? So I, those are just things I ask because I have, especially as a youth pastor, they always, there's it wrong to get a tattoo. And I go, which are your parents? You know, because they're just coming and trying to leverage me. So that's how I... So, but per, my personal conviction is almost all my staff have tattoos. And, you know, my youth pastor gets up there and he's got a long old arrow. Every, every time he's up there, you know, giving an offering message, he's got a long old arrow. Like, I don't know why, but it's an arrow. Like, you're going to stab people God, with it. I don't God, know. God, God, and then, God, and, you know, my executive pastor, he, he's, he has a Hebrew tattoo. He's got his kids tattooed. I go, great. I personally don't have tattoos because I hate pain. And I go, I'm just going to be honest. This looks good as it is. Like, you know, hey. <laughs> and, and number three, at some point, if I ever just give up and I just get large and in charge, that tattoo is going to like look all kinds of different weird things. Like, I'm going <laughs> to, so I just go, you know, hey. So, so again, I just think it, it, you should ask those, can you do this? Whatever the Bible says, whatever you do, do it as under the Lord. Yeah. Can you do this as under the Lord? Do you feel this will hurt your influence and not? And I, I, I know a lot of people that, man, that's like they tell the gospel through their tattoos. Having a tattoo means you got a story. What are you talking about? Yeah. It means it, you've been to fact, a nightclub, you know, before I, it was a church. I, Come on. Whenever I sat down with somebody and I got, you know, I, 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 there's how I often start evangelism conversations. I go, hey, tell me the story. And they're like, oh, yeah. And they go through their whole story. This one here. I don't remember this one. And uh, <laughs> so... Um, yeah, to me, this is, this is me. It comes down to their, your own conscience in terms of the gray area where Paul said there's certain things we shouldn't judge one another. In. And uh, that, that's my two cents. My only thought. You're, he's against, you're, so you're for tattoos. You're I, against tattoos. I didn't tattoos. say I'm for. Is that what we're saying? I did not say for. Sorry. I didn't say that. <laughs> I, I, I personally take <laughs> un, under a New Testament. We don't post the Q&A, Pastor Eric. We don't it's, post it. I, you can post it. Okay. I, I've, said, I've said it <laughs> in church. I, I just go, uh, I just personally go, that, that is a, a gray area where it's your personal conviction. I know, oh, wow, the old book of Leviticus says it's, it's great. There's a lot of things in the book of Leviticus yeah. we don't do anymore. Yeah, and go scrape the mold <laughs> off your house <laughs> in between your toes. Right. Right. There's, there's a lot of things there. So if you're going to do all the law, James was very clear if you're going to do one part, piece of the law, you better do it all, because if you don't keep it all, you right. don't keep it. My favorite thing is I, I had this, these, these young 22-year-old kids that come on staff, they're artistic, skinny jeans, they can't breathe, it's too tight, <laughs> and, and they got into this whole the Jewish movement, which I love Judaism in terms of just the rich Hebrew, but they go to the extreme where like, man, we got to do the festivals and the feasts, and you know, they're walking around with tzitzis, and, and here's the deal, none of them tithed. I go, how is it you believe in the entire law except one of the most important parts, which is the tithe? Like, count your seeds and bring them in, like Jesus commended it. So don't, don't show me your seedsy and your Passover festival feasts and not tithe. What do you think about shofars and worship? <laughs> Sorry, just I'll keep moving on. <laughs> Travis, did you have something to Sorry. say? Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Pastor Travis, do you have thoughts on this one? Uh, all I was going to trailer on was, you know, Paul says not everything is or everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. And there's other areas of our life. You know, we throw out long hair and tattoos and all these things. But, man, if we took that standard that we hold so strongly about in one area and applied it to all the other areas of our lives that probably are hurting our witness, I mean, it would lay us all flat. 
And I, th I think we just have to be careful that the yeah. thing we're passionate about isn't in our thing, and then we ignore everything else. You know, Jesus talked about that, I think, about wiping the inside, not the outside. Anyway. And I, I do think that, like, when you, there is some context a little bit, too, to tattoos when you look at the Old Testament, when you look at ancient cultures. Many times they were, they were a symbol of worship. Yeah. Like, they were literally doing it for worship. So there are prohibitions in the, in the Scripture to the nation of Israel. Those are civil laws that we talked about where God said, no, and you're surrounded by these people. That's an act of worship. By the way, that same conversation was had by the early church with meat sacrificed to idols. It was the same idea. Circumcision. It, it was, so, I'm, it's gone. Yeah, thank God. It's okay. Um, so, <laughs> especially if you didn't get to know when you were a baby. It's, it's, no, it's, I, you're fine. I'm good. I'm good. Okay, but. good. It's cool. Cool. <laughs> hey, I just preached a sermon I've never preached before. I get a good. pass on anything. It was I good. Said. You do. Like my filter. It was good. I don't have a filter. It was good. It was good. I told my church, my third service, I'm so tired. That I go, y'all just come because you don't know what I'm going to say, and I don't know what I'm going to yeah. say. <laughs> exactly. we, we don't post that one online. <laughs> All right, I think we've got, do we have a live question? So my question is, back to the tattoos, um, I have one myself, but would that still be considered a sin because about how body claims that our body is the temple? I think what we're if saying I'm making is, sense? Well, are you worshiping a, another god with it? No, that no. was rhetorical. I have oh. tattoos as well, <laughs> so uh -huh. I, I would say no, unless that's what your intent was. Yeah. Okay. And even then, you're saved, and you know it's still there. So I mean, I think there's, I think what we're kind of getting at is, there's probably you know deeper things yeah. that would hold you back than than those. Okay. So. To me, you know, again, let's be honest. Most of us weren't born Christians, right? <laughs> we all have a history. Most people that come into church, you you have a history, and it, it's in your tattoos. I just go, hey. It, let it be part of your story of what Jesus did inside of your life. And it doesn't mean you couldn't add something to go, my story's changed because of Jesus. The, the key is, to me is this. Any, almost anything can become a sin. It's why do you do it? When your identity is attached to your tattoos, that's a problem. Because some people put their identity in their ta tattoo. But that same Christian judging that person who puts their identity in a tattoo gets into their BMW, that's their identity, and drives off judging this person. Yeah. Another, another part of the pagan culture to which God didn't want Israel to participate in is tattoos also meant ownership, oh, wow. that you were owned by that God. So slaves were tattooed for that very purpose, just as cattle were. So that's why the mark of the beast, and, the sim, and again, we could go a million different ways with that, and what is it literal Let's, let's talk about that. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But, just kidding. But, but the point is, there's a mark because it's a sign of ownership. Yeah. The Bible says we've been sealed, Right? And Satan can see who's God's because we've been sealed in the spirit realm. We're marked. Jesus does have a tattoo, his name that no one knows on his thigh, he, he and he's right. coming back kicking grade A butt with it. So again, I think it's the religious spirit that wants to go around and point yeah. fingers at other people's skins. Hey, you know what? Why don't we go ahead and get our heart clean? Because by the time our heart was clean, you wouldn't have any time left over to judge somebody else's outward appearance. Yeah, that's really good. And, and for the record, I have a tattoo that reminds me when I gave my life to Christ, my wedding anniversary, my kids' birthday. So sometimes it's just practical. It's just practical so you don't want to forget. Anyways, so. Yeah. <laughs> Ryan, did we have a question right there? And then we'll come over to you. Um, so my question, I guess, is now we know that there is no sin that is one greater than the other. So back in Leviticus, when they were talking about the no tattoos, they also said, you know, don't shave your sideburns, you can't have bacon, don't cut your hair, all these things. I violate bacon often. Ooh. I mean, I violate <laughs> bacon I'm is violating good. in my mind right now. <laughs> <laughs> bacon is good. But that being of the Old Testament is, I mean, is that like really... A good defense when somebody does attack you that way, saying, oh, you're Christian, but you have tattoos. For the record, 95% of my tattoos are scripture or scripture related. Yeah, mine aren't, for the record, so that's cool. <laughs> um, but is that one way you, because I have used that to, like, my uncle who came at me about tattoos and be like, well, you shaved your face this morning. Yeah. Or, you know. <laughs> well, well, what, here's, here's what, so there's, there's hygiene laws. And those were civil laws for the nation of Israel. We talked about it a couple weeks ago, where there are three parts to the law. When you, when you say the Old Testament, they tend to lump in all five books um, there, and there's, there's three types of law in the five books, 
right? You have the ceremonial law, which Jesus fulfilled as being the final atoning sacrifice for our sins, so we don't sacrifice bulls and rams. And go- Does it make sense? So that he was fulfilled on the cross. Then you have the civil laws, and unless you're an ancient Israelite, uh, that, 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 that went away when they were carried off into ta- captivity and, and, and all of that. But then the moral law is the Ten Commandments that we're talking about. And I think to the, to the case of your uncle, um, and, and I have a lot of family members that were raised a certain way with a certain tradition and a certain understanding. Uh, usually when there's a misunderstanding, they're mixing all of those. So you're taking, and by the way, um, uh, that, that makes it more complicated, right? So you go, you go down to the Ten Commandments. And you ask the questions there, and then everything else is built on top of that. Here's the problem. Sometimes we invert things. Does that make sense? We'll take a civil law, we'll take a ceremonial law that's no longer in place and put it at the same place as a moral law. Okay, the big ten, like we have ten. The Pharisees did this too. They added 600 and... 613. I can never remember that number. That's an odd number. 613 rules on top of it, and Jesus rebuked them. Jesus looked at him and actually said, you're supposed to be guiding my people, bridging my people to me. You're actually a stumbling block, paraphrase. But he's a, he, it was, he had the harshest words to say for people who, who would, would, on the Christian side, do that. And so I think for your conscience, stick with the 10 and then examine your own heart and don't get hung up on all the other stuff. That's what I would, that's what I would say. There's just people you're never going to please. And it's not your job to please them. It's your job to please God. Secondly, Jesus said, judge a tree by its fruit. So there's certain people I'll go, look, we're probably not going to agree on the subject, but here's what I would ask. Would you just watch the fruit of my life and just see if you can see the fruit of the spirit, the fruit of Jesus in my life? Judge me based on my fruit, not on how I look or some of our differences. And, and, and usually they even disagree with that. The Bible's very clear multiple times, avoid foolish arguments, avoid, make note, Romans 16, of divisive people who want to bring division. And there's just some people, they have a spirit of division on them. And I just go, I just avoid it. And I just, you know what, love you. Hey, we're going to agree to disagree and, and move on. And just know the number one person you have to please is Jesus, and that's it. In the, in the larger issue we're talking about here, though, and some of you said judgment or feeling like you're judged. And to, to your point, right, somebody who criticizes you for having a tattoo, I mean, yeah, but I'm not criticizing you because you eat too much, right? I mean, there's so many ways you could lay this down that, yeah. that uh, the, the issue behind the issue is that, right? Yeah. Judging or feeling like we're judged, and well, Jesus answered that pretty mm-hmm. straight up, right? Don't look mm-hmm. at the speck in their eye, or <laughs> you're yeah. missing the log in yours. It's so good. I think that's the leveling thing for me. It's really good. It's good. Okay, we've got a couple live questions. We do have more questions that we want to get to, so we'll move away from tattoos. If we can. <laughs> I think we yeah. get to the bacon. <laughs> Unless no, I don't. It's not a okay. Bacon question. for everybody. I have Pastor tattoos, Steven. and I'm like, I mean, they're already on there, so I mean. Um, so, no, I had a question going back to something you mentioned um, about gossip. And when you gossip about somebody, it diminishes your relationship with them as well. So what do you do in the event that, um, so personally, I was trying to start a homeschool co-op that was founded on the belief um, in the greatest commandment, which is to love God and to love others. And it was, my goal was to have it be inclusive, not to single out anybody. It was literally going to be everybody was going to be welcome. And it is going to, it was going to be faith-based, but I had some people that took um, offense and felt it was controversial to be 100% inclusive um, for various reasons. And um, my name was slandered publicly. Um, she said I, that, you know, this is controversial and it was a red flag. Um, also a Christian, <laughs> which was even course, more confusing yeah. for me. So in that situation, you know, my first instinct was to, um, I posted those comments publicly. I took out her name and then I went back and I deleted them because I felt conflicted about calling, calling out these people who were making these comments publicly. Um, so in that case, what do you do? Do you just continue to move forward and glorify God? Do you, because, you know, um, by, I feel like calling her out or whatever, it would be taking his name in vain. It would be diminishing the works that he has for me. I don't know if I'm being clear yeah, here. I think so. um, what me, do you do in that case where you're the one who was gossiped against yeah. and you don't want to retaliate there, but it has uh, diminished also the view that people have of the ministry that I was wanting to start. 
So I don't Let know me say something there. to contextualize what, what we heard Pastor Eric say a while ago, because when you're in ministry, you, you hear this a lot, and it was joke but true, right? You're, you're in a prayer group and some prayer requests, and somebody says something about somebody else, it's not about them, and it's not even I volunteer to lead a prayer for so-and-so because this is on my heart. It, it turns into just take, 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 right? And, and you, you kind of get tired of that in, in prayer circles. It, it's not prayer, it's gossip, right? What you're talking about, that, that's a whole other level of, of you know, verbal abuse and slander and things like that. So if, if I'm hearing you right, the question is how do you respond yeah. to that? I actually have a thought. I have a thought for you. Integrity doesn't need a defense. Yeah. And, and by the way, I have to remember that myself. I, I've been in the habit of, of posting something and then deleting it. So, so let me just help you with that. And, and usually what happens is I'm trying to defend something that I know is right, and I'm feeling threatened by somebody else saying, no, it's not. The truth is, right is right regardless of what anybody says. And we'll all stand before God and give an account. And so my encouragement to you is if you feel called to do it, you feel like you've got a word from the Lord, you keep moving forward. Um, and, and here's the thing. Um, woe to you, not woke to you, when everyone speaks well of you. And so, and, and trust me, as pastors, we know that probably better than anything because there's just almost nothing we can do without making somebody mad. And so I think maybe focusing more on what God's saying to you. I, I would say, like, if you have a relationship with that person, and, and I, I do think that, you know, um, I do think olive branches are nice privately, not publicly. Um, but as it depends on you, Paul says, live at peace with everyone. As it depends on you, there's a lot of things that you just can't control, um, namely what people, I mean, you know, you know yeah. So that's, that would be my, my That's thought. good. I, I agree. I agree both here. I, um, I've been hurt as a pastor. You, you just, you get hurt a lot. And it's, but it hasn't been by sinners. It's only Christians. Uh, I'm 77% prosthetics uh, because I've just, you know, I've been st on, shot, stabbed. Yeah. And it's just Christians. And I, I just go, little people criticize big works, big dreams. And um, so there's a lot of different little nuggets there. I, I do agree also with what Stephen's saying. If you can give an olive branch in private, that's what I tend to do because, you know, we get criticism too every week. And so it's just, if you know that person or it's a private conversation, just bring clarity. Hey, just want to share a heart behind this, and that is evangelism. You know, how are we going to reach these people if we exclude these people? Jesus said, be in the world, just not of the world. And so how are we going to reach them? How are we going to be a light? How are they going to see Jesus? So that's the mission behind that. And, if, and so you can't. I, I, don't, I don't defend myself, especially on social media either. Um, again, I, I might just clarify, hey, we're about this. We're I about usually that. don't. Yeah, I, usually I don't either. Don't. Um, Most of the time. So um, I, I, I just, you, you get a lot of that. And um, Satan always tries to kill a vision in its infancy. Remember Moses? He was a baby. Jesus, a baby. Because vision in its infancy is vulnerable. So you're launching a ministry. You have a passion to reach all kinds of people who wouldn't be welcome in other places, who might not be able to come into the doors of a church. Where are they going to see Christ? So that's a vision. You're walking it out. Satan's going to use, and it's always a believer, and they're mature, by the way. Unbelievably mature. And very deep. Very and deep. Incredibly deep. Very, very deep. Very deep. Very deep. Very deep. And it, why? And, and they, don't, they don't realize it, but they're being used to the enemy to try to quench the vision. And uh, the week we launched our church, there was a website that all their whole mission was bashing every church that was, you know, like ours. And, and I showed up on this website. And I'm getting ready to preach the next morning for our launch service. And Satan used that to just demoralize me and beat me over the head and question myself. Oh, I don't know. Am I right? Maybe I'm not deep. Maybe I'm <laughs> That first service, I was there. It wasn't all that deep. No, it wasn't, so. really. But, you know, God wasn't done. <laughs> just kidding. Actually, he's, he's right. Truthfully, I, I don't I remember. Like, y'all don't remember the Ten Commandments. <laughs> I'm just so glad God sees what we can be, not what we are. God uses us in spite of us more than because of us. I'm good with that. So, 
You just aren't going to please everybody. And, they, and, and like I th- one, one of these gentlemen said it, woe to you when all men speak well of you. So if you don't have somebody criticizing you, it, yeah. <laughs> no, woe to you when all men speak well of you. If, everybody's, if everybody likes you, you're doing something wrong. Yeah. I mean, if Do nobody likes for, you, so now, you're probably doing something wrong too. I have had to learn. What? I've learned that if nobody likes you, you're probably doing something wrong too. That's also a truth, <laughs> extremes. But I do look for the kernel of truths because I get, I get criticized all the time. And, and you know what? Unfortunately, sometimes they're right. And uh, I started a drawer, though, of, the, you know, I'm, I, I'm, I don't suck and I suck. Uh, and it's just of, of the cards and emails that I get. <laughs> so I've told my church, I go, you do not want to miss my retirement speech. <laughs> because I am pulling out some of these emails and I'm going to say your name. You, you want to be here. So, and I want to give thanks to those that contributed to my early retirement. <laughs> so can I just tell one story? Oh, please do. Just, I'm going to share my pain. And uh, so I preached this message on stewardship, right? And it was a powerful sermon about just little things that we could do to live godliness with contentment. And I saved people tens of thousands of dollars on things they didn't need, right? I was talking about how I, I buy all these K-cups and drive by Starbucks and I'm not getting the $5 Venta, you know, and I'm like, you know, I'm 27 cents, right? And so I... So I, it was a good sermon. I had a staff member that day goes, Pastor, I cut $130 out of our, our, our monthly budget because of that message. Thank you. I'm like, oh, man, praise God. And it, it was very honoring to Jesus. I walk in. I get a car, I got a bag, and I'm going, oh, I got a gift. This is great. So I open it up, and it's, it's it, the card, of course. It's, it's a picture of, uh, of uh, like Moses, and it's Hebrews. Oh, <laughs> it, it's organic coffee cups. So inside the card, it basically just says, uh, Pastor... You're destroying the planet with your uh, non-organic coffee cups that you get from Aldi's. Uh, please try these and say, you know, you're preaching on stewardship. Shouldn't we be stewards of the planet? I go. <laughs> and it's signed, tithing church lady. So I, I go, there wasn't, this church has changed my life. Hey, can I offer a suggestion? It was just k cup, organic. It's like, that's all you got. That's all you got. I had Bible. Jesus showed up. God moved. People got saved. Thousands of dollars went into the kingdom. And all you got was organic K-cups. I'm reading her card. <laughs> Look, Jesus was perfect and they killed him. You're not better than Jesus. Uh, yeah, I, I have nothing else to add to that. <laughs> I like it. Okay, we, you have been waiting so patiently. We have one more live. Can we take it? Okay. Yeah. Uh, um, I guess in an effort to circuit, circle it back around <laughs> um, from the, the message and the, the third commandment and the question that kind of got us off track with the tattoos, um, is, it, is, an oversimpl- is it an oversimplification to say that if you have to defend your action, your gesture, your effort, your vision, um, that, that you're not in the right place in your heart because his name needs, needs no defense. But if the effort, the action, whatever it is that you're doing can glorify his name, that it's in the right place. Yeah. I, I think that's a great question, by the way. There is a time explanation clarifies, and that's different than defending. I don't need to defend me. But there are times maybe it's misunderstood and it may put God in a bad light where if I just clarified something, um, it helps somebody go, oh, that makes sense. Because I have to clarify all the time as a pastor. Hey, guys, I want to remind you, this is why we do this. This is why we do an Easter egg hunt. I know it's not about the Easter bunny. I got it. Hey, it's this, about to be at Vintage. Tell know, us about Jesus on Easter Sunday. That, that's why I, that's why <laughs> that's I said that for you. I'm joking. Thank no, you. But the core gets it, but there are people who go, I don't understand it. So there are times it's okay to clarify things because everybody comes from different contexts. So again, I don't need to defend myself. You don't see Jesus really defending himself, but he did clarify certain things, and, and that's okay. Again, I think it does come from, from the motive. You know, I, I said something um, that I kind of breezed over in the first week. Um, that I think it's a good time to maybe nail down on a bit. The truth can be really complicated because there's so many variables. There's so many things. Like we kind of built what absolute, on absolute truth, and you have what's principled. You have kind of the, the, the 
the rule of law, but then the spirit of it. And then you build on top of that relationships. Then the Holy Spirit speaks to you personally in your own conscience. And, and just kind of understanding how to navigate truth is really important. Here's, what I've, here's the rule of thumb I use in situations like that. Um, honesty. So what I, here's what I mean by that. Telling the truth can be difficult based on the hearer. But you know when you're not telling the truth. You know when there's a reason you're responding in a certain way because you were triggered you, you know that there's something in your response. By the way, it just recently happened to me. I had to literally, I was technically right, but I was wrong because I knew I was wrong. And I had to go back and say, you know what? I have to, uh, we teach this when dealing with conflict. Um, first of all, assume the person that you offended or that whatever, assume that they have something that you could learn from. Uh, that does not mean you apologize when you're not sorry. I'm not talking about that. I think that's garbage and dishonest. But, but really search your own heart and go, hey, was there a way I could have done? By the way, there always is, okay? But you know yourself m- more than anyone. And so I think sometimes from that posture of humility, it can, it can either, it, it's going to do two things, one of two things. First of all, you're going to search your heart and you're going to realize, no, like this is just what it is. And you're going to stand and you're not going to capitulate to anyone. By the way, we see, we see that in scripture. Hey, Neb, hey, Neb. I don't really care if you go through with your plan and throw us into that. I, I, I'm not bowing down to that idol. That, that, that's, you know what I'm saying? Like, there are also times where you got to go, well, you know what? I let that into my life. David, you know, with several situations in his life where he had to, he had to kind of be honest before God and, and even before people and whatever the consequences were. Here's what I would say. Just know that, that you're not going to get it right every single time. But the best the best compass that you have is the Holy Spirit inside of you, revealing to you, James says it's a mirror, and it reflects back to you what's really there. So my thing is, is before you want to turn the mirror and face it into someone else, just stare at it for a little bit. That's always helped me. Sometimes too late, <laughs> okay, but it helped me the next time. <laughs> Does that make sense? Anyways, I don't know if that's helpful. That's good. But... That's good. Can, I, can I just do one thing? Yeah. Uh, I enjoyed being with you. Thank okay. you so much for having me. I want to introduce my wife. Uh, my lovely wife over here, Sonny, stand up. I just want to introduce her. I just, she's, she's a gift from Jesus, and I am so blessed to have her and uh, have her with me on this trip. So I love you, baby. I just, just want to introduce you. She's the better, way better version of me. And, uh, oh, which, by the way, she, she actually is way more interesting than he is. The, the whole way today, I way literally true. just looked oh, at yeah. him and said it. He's like, I'm not even talking to you. Bro, anymore. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm like, we're sitting here having a... Anyways, yeah. <laughs> so glad you're here, Sonny. So glad. All right, I think that wraps up our Q&A. Can we thank Pastor Eric, Pastor Stephen, Pastor Travis? Hey.